You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to our work. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at The Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. In our last episode, we left off with bands playing and flags flying. Blogging had arrived. Yay! We had put the fear of God into David Brooks and David Broder. Big name politicians were courting bloggers and hiring online content specialists onto their staffs. The blogging community had clout. The blogging community could move the national agenda. And Drift Class, can I just make a comment here? I suppose um, so, since it's our blog, Blue Gal. Yeah, it's, I can say whatever I want. Gosh. Uh, it does seem to me like a lot of what we're talking about here is high school with money. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I want to preface everything we're going to say here with, I don't have um, a lot of time for animosity against no. people from the no. past. No, uh, I don't think about them all that often, but these were heady days and they there were. were betrayals. There were. Absolutely. And that's sort of what this is about without uh, it's not there. It's not done in uh, animosity. We're speaking merely as historians who participated. Exactly. In this era. As John Stewart would say, uh, this is all meant at the end of every sentence. Just hear the phrase with all the respect. <laughs> you know, there's a whore, you know, all due respect. Yeah. Um, that, that, kind that, of was, thing. that was a Carl Rove trick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I do hold grudges, Blue Gal. <laughs> I hope some yeah, Drift Class holds grudges much I, more than I do. <laughs> but, you know, most of mine are confined to the uh, uh, junior high and high school grudges. I still, uh -huh. you know, still nurse late at night. Um, no, I, I, this is really a historical document. And it really mm -hmm. is an attempt to sort of not set the record straight, but lay out a clear understanding and context for what hell, what the hell happened to the uh, liberal blogosphere. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we introduced um, correctly, we were on top of the world. We had, we believed we had elected a president. We had scared the crap out of the mainstream media who had for years been rolling over for George Bush and the Iraq war and lying to us and, and creating this entirely false narrative. And just, they wanted us out of the way. They did mm -hmm. not want to talk to us, deal with us, or any hear any of our critiques. And we found a way to break through in a way that actually moved the needle and changed the national agenda, which was amazing. Top of the world, Ma. Yep. Um, and in the last episode of Science Fiction University, which, of course, I'm sure you all listened to, uh, we did open the show by doing a thing that we said was unusual and we would never do it again. We read an obituary. Well, we're going to do it again. In <laughs> fact, we're going to read a couple of obituaries. This one is from the New York Times, June 5th. 2009. Blogs falling in an empty forest. Hi, I'm Judy Nichols. Welcome to my rant. Thus was born Rantings of a Crazed Soccer Mom, a blog of a stay-at-home mother and murder mystery writer from Wilmington, North Carolina. Ms. Nichols, 52, put up her first post in late 2004, serving up a litany of gripes about the Bush administration and people who thought they had, quote, a monopoly on morality. Right there with you, sister. After urging her readers to vote for John Kerry, she closed with a flourish. Practice compassionate regime change. That post generated no comments. Today, remember this is now 2009, Mrs. Nichols speaks about her blog as if it were a diet or a half-finished novel. I'm going to get back to it, she swears. Her last entry in December of last year was a curt and none too profound, quote, books make great gifts, she began, breaking the silence of nearly a month. Like Mrs. Nichols, many people start blogs with lofty aspirations to build an audience and to leave their day job, to land a book deal, or simply share their genius with the world. Getting started is easy. I remember you had a rule, Blue Gal, that you'd put someone on your blog roll if they blogged for six months, was it, or six weeks? Continuously? Yeah, six weeks. Yeah. Every day. 
persist. If you're persistent, you'll go on the blog roll. If you're there mm-hmm. for, you know, three rants and fuck Bush and gone, that's great. Yeah. And I'm sure you made it feel better, but that's really not a blog. Uh, but since it takes, uh, since all it takes to maintain a blog is a little time and inspiration. So why do blogs have a higher failure rate than restaurants? According to a 2008 survey by Technorati, does anybody still remember Technorati? I do. I do. I remember Technorati, yes. But it's uh, it's been a while. Uh, Which runs a search engine for blogs. Only 7.4 million out of 133 million blogs the company tracked have been updated in the past 120 days. That translates to 95% of blogs being essentially abandoned, left to live follow on the web, where they become public remnants of a dream or at least an ambition unfulfilled. Judging from conversations with retired bloggers, many of the orphans were cast aside by people who had assumed that once they started blogging, the world would be the path to their digital door. Yeah, and and right away, they would start mm-hmm. blogging and, and then people would show up from the New York Times offering them book contracts, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is not yeah. exactly what happened. Uh, Richard Jalichandra, chief executive officer of Technorati at the time, said that at any given time, there are 7 million to 10 million active blogs on the internet, but, quote, it's probably between 50,000 and 100,000 blogs that are generating most of the page views. He added, there's a joke within the blogging community that most blogs have an audience of one. That is a serious letdown from the hype that greeted bloggers when they first became popular. No longer would writers toil in anonymity or suffer the indignities of the publishing industry, we were told. Finally, the world of ideas would be democratized, unquote. Right. Yeah. And and I think that there was a very good use for the blog. Yes. In that you were not shouting into a void. You were actually publishing on mm-hmm. the Internet your feelings about the Bush administration. Right. There's a reason why blogs almost instantaneously became liberal political outlets is because yeah. so many people were really frustrated with the mainstream media cheering on a war that we'd been lied into for ratings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they wanted to to shout back. Yeah. And this was a way to do it. And so I think one of the reasons that you and I are still now my blog is kind of fallow, I would say. I post the podcast there, but I don't write there. Well, you write more Crooks really. and Liars every day. Because I so. write for Crooks and Liars every day yeah. or I'm editing Crooks and Liars every day. So I am on another blog. Um but you and I are both writers first and exactly. then bloggers right. second. And so uh-huh. I know um, I now use a website called 750 Words to write 750 words a day. And I've been doing that for almost a year now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the discipline of writing every day is m- what makes you a writer. <laughs> right. Doesn't matter <laughs> what you write. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter what you write. You've got to write you every write, day. It right. can be a glorified to-do list. It can be frustrations. It can be how do I feel about my mother or oh, you know, one thing whatever it, one, thing it, one thing it can't be is all work and no play makes jack a <laughs> yeah it can't be that 400 right. pages at the overlook hotel that's not writing that's psychotic yeah right and there is a lot of writing out there that is merely typing in yeah. in some respects but the point is the discipline of writing every day separates the the writer from the hobbyist right. who might say oh i'm gonna get back to that someday and and they really don't well, and, they, and, had, they had one or two things to say, and then they were done. And, and the right. ethos of the blogosphere, which is why if you go back and look at my blog, either from yesterday or from 18 years ago, mm-hmm. you will find typos in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Transpositions. It, they, uh, they've gotten less so, but the ethos was speed. Mm-hmm. The ethos mm-hmm. was reacting or getting out an opinion fast, fast, fast. You know, New York Times drops op-ed pages or columns at one in the morning, get yours out by two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and writing fast and writing well and doing it every day is work. And Steve uh, Gilliard did that. Steve he Gilliard. Did that. He really did that. Got he did up that. early in the morning to get that paper when it <laughs> dropped on the sidewalk. Yeah. And cranked. And, and cranked, cranked all day out long. responses. Yeah. 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 It, that was the standard that we sort of all aspired to, which was mm-hmm. do two or three really good posts, some original, some do your own graphics. Some of them had copies of Photoshop so we could play around with, with graphics as well. And uh, and then react to other blogs, link to other blogs. It's a mm-hmm. conversation. It's a cause. We're all part of a cause. So we're all mm-hmm. talking to each other and mm-hmm. moving the ball forward. At least so that's here's what another talking. obituary from Charles Arthur at The Guardian, June 24th, 2009. Quote, blogging is dying. Actually, no, let me qualify that. The long tail of blogging is dying. I say this with confidence. 
That confidence is based on two things, my anecdotal but wide-ranging analysis of what and how people remark on content from this section, and the surveys carried out by Technorati, again, there's that Technorati that no longer exists, which provides the Guardian with the feedback data that appears on our web pages. The interesting question is, what has replaced that blogging? Recently, over the past six months, I've noticed a new trend. Fewer blogs with links and fewer with any contextual comment. I'm defining a blog here as an individual site, whether on Blogger or WordPress or an individual domain with regular entries. Mm -hmm. Some weeks, apart from the splogs, which are spam blogs, there would be hardly anything. I didn't think we'd suddenly become dull, nor was it for want of searching. Mining for blog comments, I use icerocket.com, technorati.com, and Google's blog search. Oh, God. I remember. These don't exist anymore. No. I I used to use Google blog search all the time. All the time. They just took it away because, you know, They just took it away. They did. Uh, Where is everybody? Anecdotally and experimentally, they've all gone to Facebook and especially Twitter. Yeah. Unquote. And I do think Twitter ate the blogosphere in, in yeah. large part. Absolutely. It certainly ate the commentary in the blogosphere. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It seems like every six months since then, some magazine or newspaper has written a think piece about the demise of blogging. And yet, get this, Drift Glass, uh-huh. just this week in 2023, we find, that, we find that a bill proposed by a Republican state senator in Florida would require bloggers who write about Governor Ron DeSantis, his cabinet officers, and members of the Florida legislature must register with the state. But blogging is dead. How can zombies register with anybody? This is aimed at one particular blogger. You know it is. It sure as hell is, yeah. Uh, Bloggers who receive compensation for a given online post about an elected state officer would have to register with the Florida Office of Legislative Services or the Commission on Ethics though the requirement would not extend to the websites of newspapers or similar sites or anyone who had a lawyer who could punch back. That's what they mean. Yeah. So while blogging, especially liberal blogging, is forever dying, it never really dies, especially when Ron DeSantis needs somebody to punch. Yeah. But it definitely has changed a lot. Yeah. And how and why it changed is the subject of this particular episode. Yeah, for all you Game of Thrones nerds, what what is dead can never die, may never die. <laughs> um, and I, I prepped for this conversation for, for quite a long time. Um, and I went through a lot of feels. Um, I went through my archives, went through the archives of lots of bloggers, lots of newspaper, lots of magazines. And a lot of this stuff came rushing back to me on an emotional level. Mm-hmm. And except it was all compressed. I knew what the history was now. It wasn't, you know being sprung on me every day that, oh my God, some new outrage. And I had to really sort of back off and think of it like a historian um, as much as possible with my emotional uh, attachment as part of the history because I'm deeply attached to this medium and I've I've done lots of writing as have you. And I was drawn back to something Hunter Thompson wrote about the 1960s that really resonated with me about what the early days of blogging felt like and what it feels like now. And I'm going to quote it in part here, quote, my central memory of that time seems to hang on one or five or maybe 40 nights or very early mornings when I left the Fillmore half crazy and instead of going home, aimed the big 650 lightning across the Bay Bridge at 100 miles an hour wearing L.L. Bean shorts and a Butte sheep herders jacket booming through the Treasure Island Tunnel at the lights of Oakland and Berkeley and Richmond, not quite sure which turnoff to take when I got to the other end, always stalling at the toll gate, too twisted to find neutral while fumbling for change, but being absolutely certain that no matter which way I went, I would come to a place where people were just as high and wild as I was. No doubt at all about that. There was madness in any direction at any hour, if not across the bay, then up the Golden Gate or down 101 to Los Altos or La Honda. You could strike sparks anywhere. There was a fantastic universal sense that whatever we were doing was right, that we were winning. And that, I think, was the handle. The, that sense of inevitable victory over the forces of old and evil. Not in any mean or military sense. We didn't need that. Our energy was simply prevail. 
There was no point in fighting on our side or theirs. We had all the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. So now, less than five years later, and man, does this parallel to the blogosphere, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you could almost see the high water mark, that place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. Mm, that yeah. really is word for word what it yeah. was like. I mean, the, doc- the doctor's a hell of a writer. Yeah, he is. But you what? did feel like no matter where you clicked, you a could friend. find a fellow traveler. Yep, who was just as outraged as you were, and whether they had the same lifestyle or the same sexual orientation or the same income or the Didn't same matter. gender or anything, yeah, you could find commonality with those people out there. Yeah. Any, any time of the day or night, I was I would I would be at before I became a blogger. I was a goddamn commenter at Steve Gilliard's blog, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and at two in the morning, you could find twenty people hanging out and talking and talking in great depth, like the best kind of rap session you could ever imagine mm-hmm. about whatever Steve had written. And Steve would dip into the comment section and occasionally throw some bum out, but it was a real sense of community, and it was really true. That was not an that was not our imagination. That's how the resistance. That's how the blogosphere was rolling those days. I do see that still in existence at Hal Sparks' comment thread on YouTube when he's live. <laughs> I do, too. I absolutely do, too. Yeah. That's the place where you do see that. And I'm not on Twitch. I don't go on Twitch and, or some of these other sites. But on the YouTube channel, when he's live, there are a lot of people talking to one another there. Yes, there are. That's exa- you, that, Sparklers. It, They're called yeah. sparklers. Yeah. yeah. But that sense of community and mutuality was the thing that held the early liberal blogosphere together and made it such a potent political force. Uh And one of the first cracks in that sense of unity came in February of 2007 with something called Blog Roll Amnesty Day. (sighs) And here we want to quote one of the great liberal bloggers, uh, Al masqueraded. Who masqueraded as a conservative, which was hilarious. (laughs) He blogged under the name John Swift. Oh, by the way, I dug out your video. Yeah. Um, the the uh, with Vlog the, Roll Amnesty Day. Yeah, with yeah. the uh, soundtrack from Repo Man. Yep. Uh, maybe we link to that in this. Podcast. Yeah, I'll put that up at my blog. On, on your blog. This episode. What a great I idea. I made an ad. I mean, w- what we did, or what Al did, was to flip Vlog Roll Amnesty Day on its head. Yeah, well, and make it a, make it a day to link to smaller bloggers. But let's Ab- start with John Swift's article about what happened. Yeah. Uh, To make this day important. Uh, John Swift writes, quote, in 2007, this past weekend, Atrios, the proprietor of Eschaton, declared a blog roll amnesty day, saying, quote, one of the big complaints by new bloggers is that it's impossible to get onto blog rolls because established bloggers tend not to add them. I thought that adding new lesser known blogs to his blog roll would be a wonderful idea. Although for some inexplicable reason that I am at pains to discover, Atrios has never seen fit to link to me. I then ne- nevertheless added Eschaton to my own blog role and introduced myself to Atrios with a sincerely sycophantic email, since he is, after all, a blogging pioneer who deserves our respect. But the more I learned about this amnesty day, the more I realized that it was a very strange amnesty indeed. The amnesty he granted turned out to be amnesty for himself. He wanted to assuage himself of the guilt he might feel at kicking blogs off his blog roll instead of granting amnesty to others to swarm across the border into his domain. Quote, everyone feels a wee bit guilty about removing blogs from their blog roll, so they're hesitant to add new ones to an ever-expanding list, he explained. So Atrios deleted his entire blog roll and disappointingly repopulated it, for the most part, with the usual suspects. Then others in the liberal blogosphere followed his example, including Jesus General and PZ Myers at Feringula. And by the way, PZ linked this series at his blog, and we want to thank him for that. He did. And welcome uh, back to the very nice. PZ. Hmm? It's, you know, welcome back, man. Welcome <laughs> back. Uh, I could tell stories, but I'm not going to tell stories about PZ right now. Uh, PZ Myers at Feringula, who already takes a very Darwinian serve. Yeah survival of the fittest approach to blog rolling as he does to everything else uh (laughs) yeah marcos at daily coast joined this ruthless bloodletting it sucks and it feels bad he said daubing the tears from his eyes as he typed 
So the end result of Atrios's Amnesty Day was to make some blog roles smaller and even more exclusive than they already were. And these days, this just seems like such a bee in a bonnet. I mean, it doesn't seem that important. But it's back then, this was yeah. really important. No, it was. Well, yeah. it was. Yeah, and this is exactly what it was. It was the first crack in the idea that we were all in this together. And we were right. all part brothers under the skin, sisters right. under the skin. And, and it and didn't matter movement. how much traffic you had. If you right. were writing and you were on the right side of history in terms of the Bush administration, you Come were part of the yeah. team. Right. And I always had that attitude. And like you said, Drift Class earlier, uh, if someone blogged for six weeks, Boom, and I add them to my blog room. I wanted to know they were serious right, about that's the thing. writing right. and not just posting every week and saying, fuck Bush and then walking away. They had to be committed to doing the work. But I was a blog mom to lots and lots of people oh, back you were. then. And I was a blog dad to a bunch yeah. of people who spun off yeah. from me. I spun off from Steve. And and uh, we mentioned this either last episode or the one before. Crooks and Liars continued the tradition Today, of, yeah. Uh, today, uh, with Mike's blog roundup, which is a deliberate institutional attempt to bring bloggers who don't get enough attention um, a spotlight. And share traffic with yeah. them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, New York Magazine examined who linked to whom in the blogosphere, and they discovered that A-list blogs tend to link mostly to other <laughs> A-list blogs. This elitism strikes me. This is Al Wiesel still writing. This elitism strikes me as strangely unliberal and undemocratic. Ironically, major conservative bloggers are on average more inclusive of smaller blogs than major liberal bloggers. Oh. Although I haven't made a scientific survey, I have noticed that for the most part, the blog roles on the top conservative blogs tend to be bigger than the blog roles on top liberal blogs. Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit has more than 250 links. Michelle Malkin has 137. Captain's Quarters has a whopping 374. Compared with them, the blog roles at the major liberal blogs look downright stingy. Yeah. End of and, quote from Al Wiesel, John yeah. Swift. And, and so looking back from the uh, from the perch of 2023, uh, we can ask ourselves, how did this, why did this happen? How did this happen? What, what caused this sudden drop off in support for everybody but the top handful of people among themselves? And that's because once you've gathered a substantial crowd, the people who soon show up are called advertisers. <laughs> and that's when words like monetizing and business plan and search engine optimization start to enter the conversation. Now, I am a working writer. I have made uh, nothing like the living I used to make in corporate America or in government writing, but I do and have made a small living as a writer. And there's nothing wrong with paying the writer. There's a whole Harlan Ellison uh, a clip from one of his interviews about pay the effing writer. Um, writing well and consistently is actually hard work. And if people value it and they appreciate what you do, there's nothing wrong with asking them to support that work. But in the blogosphere, advertising dollars were directly related to traffic, to how many people show up and stick around your blog. But if you send those people away, if you disperse your readership to 100 smaller blogs, the competition for advertising dollars increases at the same rate your unique value to advertisers decrease. So for reasons of pride and ego and economics, A-list bloggers started to stop being about the cause and the community and started being about the top five or 10 blogs, passing traffic back and forth among themselves. And certain liberals became downright nasty about what they called blog whoring. Oh, yes. We can't have that, Blue Gal. Can't have that. Can't have that. Even if you as a blogger had written 2,000 words about a topic that some A-list blogger was writing about, if you linked your own work in the comments and said, I've written, you know, 10 pages about this, or I've researched this thoroughly, and here's a link to what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, that was a crime against humanity. And you yeah. would be flamed in the comments you shouldn't do this. You don't belong here. How dare you try to steal traffic? Self-promotion. How dare you? Self-promotion. How dare you? Even because if you really were researching and commenting on something that 
that was on topic. It, it was not Gal, allowed. Yeah. It's it's about the cause, Blue Gal. And, yeah, and no, really it's it's no. so gauche to really want people to read what you wrote. You're not right. You're not insisting on it. You're not demanding. You're not saying it's your right. You're simply saying, I wrote a thing that directly relates to this thing. Here's a link. Come on over if you're interested. Oh God, no. Don't yeah. ever, ever yeah. do that. Crime against humanity, gatekeeping. It was gatekeeping. It was really becoming a thing. Uh, I had a little bit of a, a tussle. He didn't respond, but I <laughs> called out Chris Bowers at Open Left. Uh, he began telling everyone that the blogging club was closed as early as 2007. Yeah, it's just did. me and my friends who matter yeah, now and it. no one else. There's no Forget room it. for anyone else on the boat. Forget it. Uh, yeah. And he held a funeral for independent bloggers in 2010. Yeah. Uh, here is my blog post response to Bowers from June 7th of 2010. Quoting myself, Blue Gal, Chris Bowers declared all the non-A-listers dead back in 2007. Now he once again posts at Open Left, a.k.a. Chris Bowers and David Sirota's house a really tiresome self-congratulation in an agonizing post, Amateur Blogosphere R.I.P. And it's completely unnecessary follow-up. Even more endless analysis of why anyone not already invited to his personal A-list circle jerk might as well hang it up. Apparently, Bowers is prompted to advertise his obviously constant navel-gazing by the hiring of the 538 blog by the New York Times. Anyway, this is Bowers writing. Anyway, kudos to 538's Nate Silver and RIP to the amateur progressive blogosphere. It provided a regular feeling of revolutionary ecstasy while it lasted, but there was no way it could last very long. It was a transitional period between a new media and political paradigm, not a new paradigm unto itself, unquote. Now to me writing again. First of all, Chris, fuck you. Secondly, 538 was never actually a blog. It was and is an electoral statistician website published daily. There is a huge difference between what 538 does and what any of us do. They are a niche unto themselves, period. And whoever had the money to buy what they do, it's worth every penny. Also, Chris, be careful what you wish for. I, for one, am very worried about what this so-called trend that A-listers are being bought out as activists. Frankly, I smell another payola scandal brewing, like the one that brought down Alan Freed and put rock and roll radio in the 50s onto the scandal sheets. I got your analysis right here. Number one, the FTC is threatening fines to bloggers and companies who promote products on their blogs without disclosing the arrangements they have to receive those products for free. How long before they want to know exactly who is paying the activist who blogs about specific progressive issues? Does this sound eerily familiar to you yeah. about a Florida <laughs> Florida yeah. man? Yeah, Florida man, yes. It might be great, for instance, for Greenpeace to hire or pay a blogger who has expertise in environmental issues. But if they continue to blog single shingle and don't disclose the relationship they have with Greenpeace, the feds have precedent to come down hard when their single shingle blog says the Greenpeace bill is the only environmental bill worth passing. Mm -hmm. Number two, the bigger a blog gets in terms of its own political action committees, the more transparency is expected of them. Holding fundraisers for stuff like tell Blanche Lincoln to go to hell. Now there's a name from the Oh past. God, Blanche Lincoln. That's, that's, that's pulling from some history books. That's there. pulling yeah. from some history. Tell Blanche Lincoln to go to hell. Sure does bring that regular feeling of revolutionary ecstasy, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but it harshes the buzz to find out that a little old blog shells out over a hundred grand for quote unquote strategic consulting. Oh yeah. Yeah. Including $24,000 a piece to two of the bloggers, Jane Hampshire and Glenn Greenwald. Oh, Glenn Greenwald. Yeah. Big paychecks for strategic consulting. Which which is fine if you t if you mention if you it. If you mention if you, it, yeah. If you say it up front, if, you, your if little it's blog. transparent, that's right. fantastic. You won the right. lottery. Good for you. Uh, as I said at my blog, at this rate, it will take me until approximately the year twenty three eleven to make that kind of PayPal scratch. But then again, I suppose answering memos of inquiry from the Federal Election Commission requires a lot of strategy and consult. Yeah. <laughs> Look, again, I'm reading from my blog. I don't begrudge anyone making money from political action and advocacy. 
But if right-wing hate radio gets wind of a problem with how progressive quote-unquote bloggers earn and spend their fundraising dollars, full disclosure, every other month I use my fundraising dollars to gas up my minivan and sometimes treat myself to an actual latte, it will bring us all down. Three, finally, let's call paid progressive activism what it is, Chris. It's lobbying. There's nothing wrong with lobbying for progressive causes. God knows. But when a progressive gatecrasher blogger becomes an inside the beltway paid lobbyist, the blogosphere doesn't die. Those people you included simply are not bloggers anymore. You're now paid political activists inside the beltway influencing policy in that way. That's it. So bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Um, one piece of personal privilege. Mm-hmm. You know, we said we're not going to make this petty or personal, but I would like to mention that uh, Chris Bauer, who announced the doors are shut, there's just the seven of us, everyone else can just right. fuck off, uh, is the same Chris Bauer who showed up late to Twitter and started Twitter whoring. Um, hey, everybody. I just showed up late. I like a lot of followers now. Could you all please follow me and give me lots of followers and give me lots of traffic? I really appreciate it. Because remember, I'm your old friend. And unfortunately- A whole bunch of us said, sorry, the doors are closed. Sorry, doors are closed. There's only us and you can't come in. And here's your post on the subject. And perhaps you should read it to yourself in your bathtub. Yeah. Yeah. No, Um, we quoted him back to him big time. But, you know, that's what privilege smells like. (laughs) <laughs> uh, hey, speaking of privilege, there was a thing called the Huffington Post. Oh, yeah. Uh, you might have heard about it. Uh, the Huffington Post was started in 2005 by former Republican turned liberal media entrepreneur Ariana Huffington. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is its arc, its overall direction really closely parallels the direction of the liberal blogosphere during the period. So it's kind of a, a good model for what happened. Uh, the original model of the Huffington Post was supposed to be like a super blog or a group blog, which was an organizational structure that became more and more popular as it became harder and harder for independent blogs, single shingle blogs to compete. The Huffington Post basic offer was content in exchange for exposure. Ariana Huffington would use her celebrity and her contacts to draw people to the site. And then you would no longer be a humble blogger you would become Ariana's brigade of, quote, citizen journalists, unquote. And that is what the kids used to call a mugs game. Mm -hmm. Uh, In January 2010, I attended one of her pitch meetings, high top Columbia College's 1104 South Wabash Building in Chicago. Lovely building, lovely school, used to work there. And at that time, I described it as somewhat similar to an alien abduction. I'm not sure how it happened or how I got there. An hour of my life just went missing. And after it, my ass hurt like crazy. Uh, This was also the night of the uh, State of the Union address, I believe. Uh, So I ended up at a bar where Barack Obama talked for a while. And then David Brooks showed up all over my TV, like genital warts for no good reason. So that was not a great night for me. Uh, Ms. Huffington spoke to the uh, thing I attended in a two-thirds full auditorium all about the media and business and politics and compassion and teamwork and stuff like that. Uh, it was her never ending hunt for storytellers who can turn dry data into moving and vivid prose. It's my recollection, which may or may not be hundred percent accurate that following that pitch meeting to hungry bloggers, she went next door and attended a much smaller meeting of investors and other interested parties on the subject of how to squeeze every last nickel out of the free content that her citizen journalists were providing. The Huffington Post launched in 2005 after John Kerry's loss in the 2004 presidential election, when Arianna Huffington and her co-founders set out to create a liberal drudge report. Uh One of those four original co-founders was Andrew Breitbart. Just let that sink in for a minute. Yeah, it's amazing. Anyway, HuffPo became a big success, and within a couple of years, it was reaching 26 million unique visitors per month, which was huge. But all of that traffic depended on three things. Arianna Huffington's celebrity, the unpaid labor of nearly 18,000 bloggers. I mean, wait a minute, citizen journalists. Yeah, get it right, Blue Gal. Providing the content. And, of course, a daily dose of celebrity side boobs. It, that really was a growing. Pitch. And that really was a thing. Yeah, Celebrity remember, side boobs was a big traffic getter for her. I remember posting on my blog, uh, ironically, a close up of Nixon topless on the beach. 
And that was uh, your celebrity California. side boob. That was my celebrity. Guess whose side boob this is? And it turned out. To <laughs> so anyway. Mm-hmm. Huff Poe became a big success. And uh, to keep growing, Huffington worked out a deal with AOL's then CEO, Tim Armstrong. And in 2011, according to an internal memorandum about the transaction, Huffington sold HuffPo for $315 million. Mm-hmm. Around $21 million from that sale went directly to Ariana Huffington. $3.4 million of which was in options that would vest over a 20-month period. Yeah. Huffington hadn't put a dime of her own money into the Huffington Post startup and owned only a very small stake of the company, and yet she would be walking away with more money than any of those 18,000 unpaid bloggers would see in 10 lifetimes. Yeah, yeah. As Sam Jackson's Nick Fury might say, it's stuff like this that gives me trust issues. Yeah. And by this time, 2010 and 2011, the liberal blogosphere was shedding bloggers for a whole host of different reasons. Some were personal, medical, financial, time-wise, family-wise, whatever. And then there was the rising level of frustration that the Democrats were not delivering on the liberal agenda that we had elected them to enact. In other words, it's the price of success. It's not as much fun to blog if you're not saying fuck Bush. Exactly. And you're actually having to argue minor policy points with a president that you support. Yeah, but who's making big mistakes at the same time. Who's making big mistakes uh, or small mistakes. The minute President Obama was inaugurated, the clock was ticking. And instead of coming out of the gate fast and strong to, you know, we love him, but he was wasting precious time at that point trying to ingratiate himself to elite Beltway conservative opinion makers like Charles Krauthammer and George Will. He was having David Brooks to the White House in the belief that they would provide entree to the sensible center of Washington politics, where center left and center right politicians could cut awesome bipartisan deals. He believed that Congress was the Illinois State House. Exactly. He really thought he was walking into a larger version of Springfield. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the deal was everybody fights and fights, but then you get behind closed doors and you pay some poker and you have a drink and then you cut a deal. Mm -hmm. And boy, was that wrong. Yep. And he I think he also thought Charles Krauthammer and David Brooks could bring congressional Republicans to heal or would speak for Washington Republicans. Yeah. And. That was not the case. And holy crap was that. No. Yeah. no. He it was a complete the, failure. The, it was a complete well, failure. Well, he got the butler mixed up with the owner of the mansion. Exactly. The The strategy was a complete failure because there were no Republicans in the sensible center in Congress. No. The sensible center in Congress didn't exist. All this diversionary tactic did was buy time for the Republican Party to regroup under the fake Tea Party banner. Yeah. And the Republican Party was made up not just of Congress people, but big money donors who were willing to give money to Glenn Beck to promote the Tea Party right. and make this AstroTurf group a reality. Mm-hmm. The Republican Party had been shattered by eight years of Bush, by the Iraq war debacle, Hurricane Katrina, revelations of American torture programs like Abu Ghraib, and the collapse of the global economy. Obama's presidency was supposed to be the coup de grace. Instead, with Obama back on his heels and the fake Tea Party getting wall-to-wall coverage, not only on Fox News, but also on the mainstream media, the GOP came roaring back in the 2010 midterms with enough momentum to take back the House of Representatives and put enough Republicans in the Senate to guarantee that anything Democrats proposed would be filibustered to death. Yeah. And they were on record as saying they were going to filibuster their own bills mm-hmm. just to stop Obama from winning anything. Their their number one priority was was kneecapping him and taking him out. And sometime in his second term, that finally dawned on him, that there mm-hmm. was no mm-hmm. way at all to win these people over. But by that time, you know, that ship had sailed. Uh, now, to those of us who were liberals, uh, all of this, I'm going to tell you how it felt. It felt like we're watching the worst, dumbest horror movie playing out in very slow motion. And we're the helpless audience. And we're yelling at Obama, don't open that door, man. Don't go in that room. And look out, Mitch McConnell is right behind you. But Obama kept walking through the door and kept going into that room and kept trusting that Mitch McConnell really wasn't a serial killer. He's a nice guy and I can do deals with him. So we've talked about all the counter pressures that were fracturing the liberal blogosphere. But we haven't touched on the biggest one yet. But before we do, 
How about some more fun obituaries about the <laughs> little the blogosphere? Yeah, let's, let's do some more of those. We're going to jump ahead to the year 2011. From the New York Times, blogs wane as the young, you know, the ute, drift to sites like Twitter. Uh, from Tech Radar, March of 2011, blogging is dead, but what killed it? From Gaping Void in June of 2011, oh no, blogging is really, really dead this time. Uh, from a site called Big Tricks in August 2011, Oh shit, blogging, blogging is dead. And from Fast Company in 2012, why blogging is dead and what's next? Now, wasn't that fun? Isn't it fun <laughs> to hear your profession pronounced dead over and over and over again, or at least your avocation? So what put liberal blogging back on its heels and onto the obituary page over and over again? It wasn't just economics or exhaustion or the really clear message from top tier bloggers that this was now a caste system and those on the top would remain on top forever. And if you weren't present at the creation at just the right time, you were out of luck forever. Now, all those things significantly weakened the sense of community among liberal bloggers, but the earthquake that really changed the landscape was political success. Mm -hmm. it was the election of Barack Obama in 2009 and the series of legitimate disappointments that liberals experienced once he was sworn in because suddenly... Liberal bloggers had to contend with a concept that had not been part of the lexicon during the failed Bush administration. The concept of modulation, of distinctions, uh, the discouraging realities of trying to govern when half the country doubts the president is even a citizen, and the GOP has all but announced that it would do anything short of storming the fucking Capitol to destroy him, which they would eventually get around to. Um, during the Bush years... 10,000 fuck Bush blogs were launched. It was really simple. It was motivating. It was a hell yeah idea we could all get behind. But what do you do when there's a Democrat in the White House? A Democrat whose campaign had been agile and eloquent and smart and brilliant utilizing the blogs, but whose administration was slow and ham-fisted and naive and just jaw-droppingly foolish at times. For this part of the conversation, we need to introduce you to two new phrases, Obama for America. Yeah. Or OFA and hippie punching. Yeah. Yeah. OFA was how Obama won the White House. And hippie punching was how that White House managed to alienate its most energetic and battle hardened activists, like the liberal blogosphere, just when they needed them most. Parts of this are from a Rolling Stone article from February of 2010 entitled, No, We Can't. Obama had millions of followers eager to fight for his agenda but the president muzzled them and he's paying the price. Obama for America was unlike anything anyone in modern politics had ever seen. It was the brainchild of Obama's senior advisor, David Pluff. The quote, brains of Obama's campaign, the man who transformed a shoestring organization into a high-tech juggernaut, unquote. The day Pluff handed control of OFA over to the Democratic National Committee. Oof and changed its name to Organizing for America. The group had 13 million email supporters, 4 million donors, 2.5 million activists connected through the My Barack Obama social network, and $18 million still left in the bank. Quote, even Republican strategists were staggered. This would be the greatest political organization ever put together if it works, said Ed Rollins, who was to Ronald Reagan what Pluff is to Obama. No one's ever had these kinds of resources, said mm -hmm. Ed Rollins. Mm -hmm. OFA wasn't a mere mailing list. It was a network of millions of activists, bloggers, and organizers who knew the lay of the land down to the street level. They were not merely volunteers who showed up to phone bank. They were modeled on Obama's own years as a community organizer. People willing to work long hours talking to neighbors about Obama's vision for the future. Quote, if you want to know how I'll govern, Obama said, just look at our campaign. His activists wouldn't just be cheerleaders. They would be partners on delivering his mandate, serving as the most fearsome whip Washington had ever seen. Quote, at the end of the campaign, we entered into an implied contract with Obama, says Marta Every, who served as a regional field organizer in California for the campaign. He was going to fight for change and we were going to fight with him, unquote. But it all depended on David Pluff, and Pluff was physically and emotionally exhausted by the 2008 campaign. So he decided to hand the OFA over to the Democratic National Committee, 
which the article describes as making about as much sense as moving Greenpeace into the headquarters of ExxonMobil. Yeah, it was. They're just two different organizations, like taking Taco Bell ingredients over to Jimmy John's. They don't make the same they thing. <laughs> they don't, and they can't coexist. It has to be one or the other. I mean, right. one of them, they, they, one of them's going to win that fight, and it was right, right. Sadly, if you're going to try they, to put it all under one roof, it's not going to work. No. Steve Hildebrand, Obama's deputy campaign manager, proposed spinning OFA off into an independent nonprofit. Yeah. Like Freedom Works or American for Prosperity on the right. There they would be free to raise unlimited funds and, quote, put enough pressure on conservative Democrats to keep them in line, unquote. But, man, let's underline that. Yeah. Pressure on conservative Democrats, actual Democratic organizers pressuring Democrats to, 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 to get in line. To support right the president. Support the Democratic president. Yes. Right. Crazy talk. I know. Crazy, Crazy talk. Instead, Obama administration people like Rahm Emanuel took the lead in trying to pass legislation. So while the OFA could have been used to pressure conservative Democrats into getting in line, including running progressive candidates against them in the primary. Yeah, like Ned Lamont. Yeah, yeah, like Ned Lamont. Right. Instead, the Obama administration let people like Rahm Emanuel bench the OFA and shelve the idea of people powered reform in favor of old-fashioned backroom deal-making, which ceded power to the obstructionists inside the Democratic Party, like Joe Lieberman and Ben Nelson. Trying to reform politics does not mix with trying to butter up obstructionist politicians in your own party. It just doesn't. No, it doesn't work. So not only did the White House fail to use the OFA to push for health care, it also worked to silence other liberal groups. Quote, In a little publicized effort, top administration officials met each week at the Capitol Hilton with members of a coalition called the Common Purpose Project, which included leading activist groups like Change to Win, Rock the Vote, and Move On. In August, when members of the coalition planned to run ads targeting conservative Democrats who opposed health care reform, Rahm Emanuel showed up in person to put a stop to the campaign. According to several participants, Emmanuel yelled at the assembled activists, calling them fucking retards and telling them he wasn't going to let them derail his legislative winning streak. We're going 13 and 0 going into health care, he screamed. We're not going to be 13 and 1, unquote. Yep, that's, that's Rahm Emanuel. That sounds just like Rahm Emanuel. It really does. And, <laughs> and, and there's a place for that. This was not the place for that. Yeah. The place yeah. for that was, was beating the crap out of Republicans, not beating the crap out of your your most ardent supporters, which brings us to the term hippie punching. Uh, this is where a pundit or politician is so worried that speaking the plain truth about a Republican atrocity will get them tagged as a liberal. So they invent some straw man on the left and then attack it, thus providing, uh, sorry, pop, 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 thus proving that they are not a liberal, but in fact have attacked both sides and therefore must be a sensible centrist. You know, everyone loves sensible centrists, It's also why we liberal bloggers sometimes refer to ourselves as dirty fucking hippies. Now, here's a fun fact. The term hippie punching was introduced to the mainstream media by a friend of this podcast and your colleague at Crooks and Liars, Blue Gal, Susie Madrak, who's been a troublemaker since Christ was a corporal. She sure has. And and just won't shut up and won't stop being awesome. (laughs) She won't, but that's a good Um, thing. (laughs) <laughs> During a September 2010 White House conference call with bloggers in which Susie called out the Obama senior advisor, David Axelrod, this is from the Washington Post, quote, top Obama advisor, David Axelrod, got an earful of the liberal blogosphere's anger at the White House moments ago when a blogger on the conference call called out Axelrod directly over White House criticism of the left, accusing the administration of, quote, hippie punching, unquote. We're the girl you take under the bleachers, but you won't be seen with in the light of day. Unquote. The blogger Susie Madrak of Crooks and Liars pointedly told Axelrod on the call, which is organized for liberal bloggers and the progressive media. Unquote. Fun fact. We got the name of this podcast from uh, Robert Gibbs uh, because that's what he called those of us on the left who were bothering him and joggling the administration's elbow about, you know, not caving to Republicans over and over again. It's the professional left who's out to get us. It was hippie punching. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. this is when a seemingly irreparable fracture 
of the liberal blogosphere happened right around this time. First of all, Air America, which was the only liberal radio voice anywhere, pretty much, had cratered in early 2010. And now the White House that we believed we had delivered to Barack Obama was treating us like the proverbial redheaded stepchild. And this is the worst part of all. We knew that trying to placate Republicans and coax them into playing nice by punching us dirty hippies would never work. And you know what? It didn't work. And Obama got played. And that's when a whole bunch of liberal bloggers in this liberal blogosphere became permanently contrarian. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Nothing mattered nope. besides saying fuck you to the administration, whatever administration it fuck was. Obama. Yeah. yeah. It's it's whoever's in charge is a monster. They're all the same. They're all monsters. And I'm going to make a living doing that. Yeah. By 2006, Marcos Melitzas and Daily Coast were driving tens of thousands of viewers to MSNBC. And Marcos had become a regular guest on Keith Olbermann's MSNBC Countdown show. And at the very first yearly Coast event in Las Vegas in 2006, among the list of speakers, among the list of speakers were John Amato, Barbara Boxer, Ari Melber, Ambassador Joe Wilson, and Senator Harry Reid. And also were 2006 blogging heavyweights Jane Hampshire of Fire Dog Lake, David Sirota of the Progressive States Network, and Glenn Greenwald of Unclaimed Territory. Is that the same Glenn Greenwald who's on Tucker Carlson's show all the time? Oh, now? yeah. And, and that story is is a future, no fair remembering stuff. I guarantee you. I might have to do it solo, uh, but yeah, it's coming. Don't worry, Blue Gal, it's coming. By 2010, a Twitter fight between Joe Scarborough and Marcos had given MSNBC executives the excuse they were looking for to ban Marcos from the network. And by 2010, Hampshire, Sirota, and Greenwald had all begun transitioning through the both sides do it, never, never land, and then pivoting hard into Obama is worse than Bush territory. Yeah. And I found a quote from, I think it was Glenn Greenwald, or maybe it was Jane Hampshire, about Obama being worse than Cheney. <laughs> worse than Cheney. Worse than Cheney. That's how far things had gotten that fast. Anyway. Yeah. In a 2010 column, Greenwald was aggressively advocating that Democrats should be willing to vote third party and, quote, and I'm not making this up, lose the next several elections, unquote, and cede complete control of the government to Republicans for the foreseeable future in order to teach the Democratic Party a lesson, after which the proletariat masses will rise up or something, some, who knows, something will and happen I, that'll be good, we promise. I want to issue one inline correction. That wasn't just a column. That was him lecturing oh. at, I think, uh, Wisconsin or Michigan University. I have that video on my blog. <laughs> and it has caused me no <laughs> end of trouble because I kept posting it saying, this is Glenn Greenwald in 2010 is telling Democrats to boycott elections and let Republicans win a bunch of elections in a row because that'll show them. And um, what sort of madness is this? But that was well, that's popular. that's privileged white male madness. That's what yeah. that is, because he's never going to miss a meal, no matter no. who is in the White House, who's in charge. Nope. He, he'll be fine. Mm -hmm. There is an expression that is commonly attributed to Ronald Reagan. If you're explaining, you're losing. And there's a lot of truth in that. In this liberal blogosphere fight, if you fell in line with Greenwald's fuck Obama brigade, you were winning because you didn't need to explain or justify or balance anything. And Greenwald brought all of his trademark pettiness, smugness, and vindictiveness to the party. On the other hand, if you were trying to balance legitimate criticism of and anger at the Obama administration with realistic appraisals of much worse horrors that were waiting behind door number two, you were explaining, which means you were losing. And woe to the liberal blogger who explained too loudly because, yes, indeed, the Greenwald horde would sooner or later be coming for you as yeah. it came for Drift Class. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know this because they came for me. And they came. They got me good. They got me good. Uh, it cost me materially. It, they trashed my reputation on the liberal blogosphere. I lost, as I've said before in this podcast, a third of my traffic. I lost revenue. Um, all for legitimately criticizing Glenn Greenwald for the lies at this point he was telling. And holding to him to standards that he himself had created and espoused for everyone else but him. Um, I was drone glass. I wanted to murder children. I was an obot. And the pivot happened overnight. And we were all friends. We were all marching arm and arm, arm up that hill. And suddenly I was a monster and a uh, bootlicking, jackbooted fascist. Boom. And needless to say, 
uh, conservative media and the mainstream media were delighted by <laughs> our little civil war over here in the liberal blogosphere because it took pressure off of them as they went about memory holding the entire Bush administration and their roles in enabling it uh, and ignoring the ongoing Republican campaign to destroy the Obama administration by obstruction and filibuster. Um, and finally, getting very, very excited by this new independent patriotic grassroots movement that called itself the Tea Party. Uh, the mainstream media during these times could carpet bomb the national conversation with story after story praising this brand new Tea Party and asking, why won't Obama lead? And now that the OFA had been mothballed and its most passionate leadership scattered, the Obama administration had no grassroots mechanism to effectively push back against any of it. Now, this whole dynamic becomes supercharged in 2013 when Edward Snowden handed over a huge cache of stolen NSA documents to Glenn Greenwald, which overnight elevated Greenwald from vindictive contrarian asshole to the most famous journalist in the world. And then just a few months later, it became super, super charged when Peter Omidyar, who was the founder of eBay, gave Glenn Greenwald a quarter of a billion dollars and a relatively free hand to start his own media company. Greenwald now had a world stage and a virtually unlimited budget, had a huge army of online acolytes at his disposal, and a long, long list of grudges and scores to settle. It was time to hunt liberal heretics. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, a scumbag New York real estate developer and minor TV game show celebrity was making a name for himself with the Republican base with a barrage of tweets that went on year after year, calling into question Barack Obama's birthplace and citizenship. And that leads us into the next and final episode of this history of the liberal blogosphere, where we will ask the question, How's that disrupt the corrupt duopoly thing working out for you? Don't forget, we're always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in this way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.